Okay, um, today we're going to talk about cancer immunology and immunotherapy. Um, it's a new area that's really, really hot and a lot of people are interested and uh, my group is also devoting a lot of effort to develop methods in this area. So um, if you look at the cancer mutations, uh, if you remember some of the earlier lectures on this, um, we've, we see that um, there are cancers that have less mutation. Usually these appear in pediatric tumors or tumors that face inside, for example, um, blood, brain, or prostate. Whereas uh, there are cancers that appear in older patients especially if they face outside, such as lung and melanoma, they have a lot more mutations. And in these tumors, once the tumor develops, even if you can find a drug that targets the cancer, these are usually very difficult to treat because they have many other mutations and the DNA is not very stable. And so they can very easily evolve resistance against the drug. Um, and so, you know, for precision medicine, the, the one, goal was to use really one targeted drug that specifically target the cancer mutation to cure the cancer and spare the normal cells. Unfortunately, if we use only single agent to treat a cancer that has many mutations, it's like trying to use a single policeman to clear up this crazy traffic jam. And so um, one very exciting discovery or uh, development in the cancer world is the discovery of the cancer immunotherapy or the, the development of cancer immunotherapy. In 2013, this is rated as the breakthrough of the year. And in 2018, two, uh, the two this, um, early developers of cancer immunotherapy were awarded the Nobel Prize of uh, Physiology and Medicine for their pioneering work in developing cancer immunotherapy. And so um, let's just look at the immuno. There are actually many different type of immunotherapy, uh, but in order to understand that first, let's understand cancer immunology. So one question you, know, you ask people is, would tumor grow uh, that's growing in one individual necessarily growing in another individual? Um, so you can try this you know, in mouse. We know that very often we grow human tumors in mouse or mouse tumors in another mouse. In fact, in cancer research, unfortunately, earlier in the last, gen, uh, last century, there are people who you know, they didn't know enough science to try to grow one tumor in another person's tumor. I mean, another person. And the question is, would tumor grow in another individual? And most of the cases, they probably won't because we have immunity. Um, so the idea is, you know, if we have normal tissues, Initially, if there are some cancer cells, whether it's coming from the individual themselves or it's coming from external, um, very often the immune system can re recognize this as foreign and reject it. This happens with um, organ transplantation. It could be that the host can reject the, well, if, if you don't um, eliminate the, or, or if, if there is no good matching, the, the, the uh, the receptor or the, the, the patient who accepts the donated organ might be rejecting the donated organs, right? This is because of our immune system recognizing the, the, something as foreign. And so very often when cancer cells really start, our immune system is able to recognize this and, and eliminate this. Unfortunately, um, so these are usually highly immunogenic, or transform the cells, they, they create a very strong immune response. But um, as, um, as we age, potentially um, people's immune system become weaker. And also, if the cancer is allowed to persist in there over time, it will uh, evolve other mechanisms. So one way is for this cancer cell to become less immunogenic. Um, and so then the immune system can't recognize this very well. In addition, the cancer cell might evolve other mechanisms, which even if the immune system can recognize it, 
it will not really react strongly to eliminate the cancer cell. And so at this point, it's more in equilibrium. And, but then when usually by the time a cancer is detected in a patient is because the cancer cell has already evolved the mechanism so that it escaped the immune response. Even though the immune system is there, either it's kind of much, much weaker or it's being uh, suppressed by the cancer uh, cell. And so, so in general, um, the, the reason we can grow a tumor in a mouse is very often because that, that mouse has a, a suppressed immune system. Then you can actually put a tumor in the mouse to grow very quickly, okay? And so um, one of the earliest immunotherapy is the active immunotherapy. This is um, by giving the patient cytokines. So, so cytokines are uh, cell-secreted proteins when they encounter foreign particles, they can stimulate cell growth, inflammation, differentiation, repair, and immune response. There are many different cytokines. And one very important one is IL-2. And this cytokine, if you see it, you know, it's being secreted by some immune cells, but you can also sy synthesize this IL-2 as a therapeutic protein that you can give to the patient and um, it can activate T helper cells, can activate B cells, activate T cells, activate NK cells. Not only they proliferate, they can also have higher activity. And this has been approved um, by FDA for treating kidney cancer and melanoma. And they just generally boost the overall immune cells inside the patient body. It's not specific. All the T cells get activated, which could cause problems such as a cytokine storm. So the patient has such a huge immune response. They usually have uh, fevers that does not subside. In some sense, um, the side effect of IL-2 is, uh, is a symptom that's very similar to COVID-19 response for the very acute symptom patients. Okay, so that's kind of the active immunotherapy. Yes, the patient has a much stronger immune system, a uh, boost, which can eliminate a cancer, but the patient can also have very potentially dangerous immune responses. Um, what really got the cancer field to be very excited about cancer immunotherapy is um, the therapeutic antibodies that are blocking the immune checkpoint genes. And that's the main discovery of James Ellison and uh, uh, Hanjul. And so the idea is, um, all of our uh, cells, actually normal cells, um, normally express uh, or present all the degraded proteins onto the cell surface for our immune system to check. You can imagine our immune cells, such as T cells and B cells, as guards in the body. They have receptors on the cell surface to do this checking, to check all the proteins that are presented on our normal cells to see, okay, you know, these are, are our cells or not. Actually, when our immune system or our T cells and B cells are, are maturing, there's a process to eliminate all the T cells and B cells that recognize self. And so any T cells or B cells that circulate in our body are only there to recognize things that are not self, or at least have stronger response to things that are not self. And so you can see, you know, the T cells are having this receptor. By the way, every T cell has a different receptor. They recognize something different. You know, they might recognize some virus or some uh, bacteria or some other things. So not self. Um, and uh, the, the, the normal cells will present the presented uh, or degraded proteins under the cell surface. And when it's all normal, it's okay. But if say a uh, normal cell is being infected by the virus, uh, the viral protein will also be presented on the cell surface. Then it can be recognized by the T cell as, uh, as a, a bad sign and the, the T cell will eliminate the host cell that carries the virus. But um, in, in this case for cancer um, tumor, uh, we know that tumors have mutations and those mutations can also be presented onto the cell surface and that can be recognized also by T cells. And so this actually happened in, in every day in our 
normal individual without a cancer diagnosis, because DNA replication has a natural percentage of errors, there could be some mutations that happen, but if we have an intact immune system, those can be recognized quickly and those cancer cells can be eliminated by the T cells. And the elimination happens in two ways. Uh, the T cells can recognize the uh, cancer cell. And once this happens, when the T cells are activated, they secrete some cytokines. These are like bombing, right? So, um, such as interferon gamma, which you know, basically makes the nearby cancer cells die. In addition, the T cells that can really recognize the cancer cells, um, they are also attached to the cancer cell, have um, a porphyrin which pumps a hole on the cancer cell, and then secretes additional uh, killing signals such as granzyme through this hole to the cancer cell, and then start the cancer cell death program in, in, inside the cancer cell. And so these ha things happen in our, our, our normal body. Um, unfortunately, if our immune system becomes weaker, one possibility is actually with age, our T cell diversity decreases because T cells are matured in the thymus and the thymus function pretty much go away, or at least majority of it goes away after puberty. And so if you monitor people's T cell in the blood for their different T cell receptors, you will see that the diversity of the T cells decrease with age, and this, this rate actually decreases faster in male compared to female. This probably explains why females develop, whether well, the percentage of um, patients with cancer are, are fewer in female than male. Um, it's, it's, you know, recently there are some hypotheses that, um, or, or, or at least some projections that cancer will affect one in three in male, but one in, in four in female. And probably also as people age, you know, live longer, this rate could be one in two in male and one in three in female. Uh, this is potentially because the, the male T cell receptor diversity decrease. So uh, if a T cell that's supposed to recognize the cancer mutation disappears in your body, then the cancer cell can grow with that mutation. Um, in addition, the cancer cell can learn to adapt to the T cell uh, response. And so they can evolve to have, or they, they can evolve to express um, some ligand, in this case, uh, PDL1 or other ligand, which can interact with receptors on the T cells. So, so for example, if PDL1, you can imagine it's like a little ligand, which can interact is like an alcohol um, that interact with the receptor on the T cells. And so even though T cell initially use the T cell receptor recognizing the cancer cell as foreign, then this ligand will actually suppress the T cell from getting activated. And so the T cells can get really, you know, dysfunctional or drunk in some sense and not do the killing job. And so the, the current immune checkpoint antibodies are these antibodies that can block you know, the PD-1 or block PD-L1 or block the CTLA-4 so that um, the T cells can be activated. So basically they stop the ligand from interacting with the receptor. So um, PD-1 can no longer suppress T cell activation. And then it's like you pour ice water on a drunk soldier, right, or a drunk guard, and they wake up quickly and they say, wow, what happened? Um, and then maybe they will be back on the you know, fighting spirit again. And, um, and through the receptor, they very quickly recognize the cancer cell as foreign and then can eliminate the cancer. And that's how the checkpoint antibodies work. Um, so, they, so basically checkpoint blockade antibodies can activate T cells and also boost the immune system. But the T cells after they are treated, they don't all activate, only the ones that can recognize the cancer mutations will get activated. So compared to a general IL-2 treatment, checkpoint antibodies are, are activating the subset of those T cells that really are killing the cancer cells, are recognizing the cancer mutations. That's why it has much less side effect and it's kind of desire, desirable. And those actually are creating long-term cures and patients who can 
um, be completely cured from cancer and be tumor free for, for many, many years, which is really quite exciting. Yeah, sorry, here is a new tumor eliminated. Uh, so in addition to the checkpoint inhibitors, recently there are also development of CAR T's. And so the idea is that um, the CAR T is developed for, from any individual cancer patient. You take their T cells. So by the way, these are not uh, T cell cancers. These are you know, usually B cell cancers. Um, so if we can um, get the T cells from the cancer patient directly and then use engineering to uh, engineer the T cells to carry a receptor. So on the, the T cell surface, these are, um, and so there, there's an antibody on the cell surface which can uniquely recognize the cancer cells. And then once it, it binds to the cancer cell or get activated, the internal T cell will start the killing mechanism to start kill the cancer cells. And, uh, the, and so if we can engineer such T cells, then um, in the petri dish or whatever, in the cell factory, you can treat these T cells with IL-2 to create an army, basically a, um, a special uh, T cell troop, right? And you can create a clone, many, many copies of this, and then you infuse the T cells into the patient. And then um, the T cells will circulate in the body. And anytime it sees the cancer cell with this receptor, the T cell will get activated to kill the cancer cells. And this has been really successful in treating B cell related tumors. And because B cell has CD19 and CD20 on the cell surface, which has good antibodies that uniquely recognize them. And so this can be, be used to treat B cell lymphoma or B cell leukemia. Uh, you do kill your good B cells as well, um, but hopefully your bone marrow can later on recreate the B cells. But the, the CAR T is like a one dose. You, you inject this dose. It, so basically you take out the T cells from the patient, uh, engineer the, the CAR and amplify this T cell to 10 to the 10th. And then you do one shot injection to the patient. And hopefully that will wipe out enough of the cancer the, or well, wipe out the cancer cell. And then later on, hopefully uh, the, the new B cells generated will be the correct B cells and the patient will be, will be cured. And this one shot cost about half a million dollars and you just pray that it will work. Um, um, but there are trials and these patients have been cured and they work on mostly uh, hematologic tumors because of the CD19, CD20 CAR works very well. There are challenges for solid tumor CAR T if you want to use CAR T for, say, lung cancer or breast cancer. There are a number of challenges. The first is we don't know what antibody are specifically recognizing cancer cells and are sparing the normal cells. It has to be really specific. And the second is uh, because B cells, uh, and you know, these are usually circulating, so you just get the, the T cells inject them in the blood, it will work. But um, for solid tumor CAR T's, we need to make sure that T cells can actually get into the tumors. When they circulate in the body, they can really find the cancer cell and enter uh, the, the tumor. And also, once uh, the T cells recognize the tumor, it could be that the tumor can also quickly evolve uh, PDL1 to make the T cell dysfunction dysfunctional. So how to maintain the CAR T cell activity to really do, do the killing job at the, you know, all the distal uh, solid tumor sites, that's also a challenge. Um, the next uh, immunotherapy is, yeah, so it's, uh, it's similar to the CAR T, it's like a adoptive T cell transfer. Uh, again, um, we need to, so in this case, if we can isolate the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte, this is directly taking a, a tumor out and separates the cancer cells and the immune cells. And so um, in, in this case, the cancer cell, uh, you can kind of put them into little wells. And, uh, um, and uh, actually, um, for the immune cells, you can grow them into single cell clones. So you can see here, or, or a single or, or, or a little cluster of uh, immune cells. Uh, 
And then you ask which of those immune cells really can recognize the cancer cells and secrete cytokine. That would mean this is a immune cell that uniquely recognizes the cancer cell. And when you see that, that's the, the, the clone you want to use IL-2 to proliferate a lot. And then again, um, you could, you could uh, externally create a mixture of immune cells. They all recognize either the same or slightly different tumor antigens. Then you inject this back into the patient and hopefully they will kill the, kill the cancer cells in the body. And this has been done in both solid tumor and uh, hematologic tumors. Right? So, um, so this rely on um, us, uh, our ability to recognize unique T cells that can recognize cancer cell antigens and the, uh, create, secrete cytokines that kill the cancer cell. And then you externally amplify those and create a pool of this and inject back to the patient. Right? So in this case, we don't necessarily know what is the cancer antigen that this T cell is recognizing. But later on, there are also studies doing this. So um, after the cancer cell, uh, sorry, the tumor are excised from the patient, we can separately do uh, mutation profiling using whole exome sequencing from the tumor, but also look at, you know, grow the immune cells. So in this case, um, after um, we do mutation profile from whole exome sequencing, the scientists can predict the immunogenic mutation, which mutation are likely to create an immune response. And in this case, um, all the mutations, you don't need to create the full gene. They create kind of a, a, a artificial uh, a gene cassette where each uh, little piece is one uh, mutation from the original gene. So you only need to create a little peptide of say 10 to 15 amino acids or, or little peptides where the mutation happens in the middle. So this could be the mutation coming from like uh, BRAF gene. This could be the mutation from uh, another one well, like a, a recurrent mutation from from uh, from the tumor and so or, or, or a driver mutation from the tumor that's immunogenic right so if you can predict which of those mutations are immunogenic we can put them in these little mini gene cassettes and then um, in, like engineer the dendritic cells in the in the patient to express the collection of these little uh, mutations and then co-culture the dendritic cell with the T cell. So the, so the T, so basically the dendritic cell will present these mutations and the T cells that recognize those uh, mutations will get activated. And those, you, you can again activate those T cells and proliferate a big army of 10 to the tens of T cells and inject them back into the patient. And those uh, are, we can train the, army to specifically recognize the cancer mutations, right? So those have also been done. Um, there are also cancer vaccines. Um, and uh, most of the vaccines that you know, people talk about nowadays, like flu vaccine, are prophylactic. You let the patient see the bad guys before. Uh, these are usually dead uh, um, for like a smallpox or a flu. These are some dead proteins on the on the the virus or the bacteria so that your body can generate the immune system unfortunately for cancer people don't haven't done any prophylactic vaccines these are mostly done as therapeutic vaccine the patient has already been diagnosed with cancer and uh, we can you know uh, we can isolate the tumor figure out you know which peptides represent some tumor antigen so you can kind of you know mush up the, the tumor um, and then uh, train the dendritic cells so in this case um, you know the, 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 the dendritic cell can present the tumor lysate so for example um, 
so dendritic cells are professional antigen presenting cells. They just chew, you know, they eat up other cells and they, 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 they present the chewed up material onto the cell surface. And so you can put the tumor lysate with the dendritic cell and then they would present this onto the cell surface and you inject just those dendritic cells back to the patient. Or we can create a peptides that are representing the tumor mutations. And, and let the dendritic cell present those onto the cell surface. They are also work using viral vectors. Uh, th this way, the viral vectors can be directly injected into the patient. The viral vector can, can carry a mu tumor mutation um, inside, and then they are injected into the, uh, uh, in injected into the patient. And, Interestingly, these viral vectors very often like to go to the location where the cell is proliferating a lot because they want to kind of uh, uh, also hijack the system to grow, right? So they, they like to go to the cells that uh, are growing a lot. And so they very often home to the tumor site and because they also present the, the tumor peptide that they carry the tumor peptide payload, then they can also be recognized, hopefully, by our immune system better. And so they are these oncolytic viruses. They, they preferentially infect and analyze the cancer cells. And also, they can stimulate the immune uh, response. OK, so um, these are uh, other ways that people can, can use immunotherapy. And um, another recently very exciting way of immunotherapy is personalized a new antigen vaccine. And so basically, um, if a patient is diagnosed with cancer, you can take the tumor out and do the mutation profiling, figure out which mutation might be presented or immunogenic, and take those immunogenic mutations. You can make a tube of those immunogenic mutations, whether as RNA or small peptides. So it's a collection of, say, 20 to 30 different potential immunogenic mutations, either as RNA or, or peptide, and then inject that into the patient. And then, for example, you can imagine if you give it a, a pool of peptides, and the circulating immune cells in our body will very quickly, is like, here, uh, let all the blood T cells or, or yeah, see what are the bad guys look like. And those T cells, when they see the the immunogenic peptide, they will proliferate, they will activate, and then they will also circulate in the body to identify the distal cancer cells and kill them, right? So, um, so there are also challenges, you know, first of all, how to predict new antigens, how to ensure that those new antigens are presented in somehow in your body so that the T cells can see it. It needs to be, you know, if it's a peptide, it can be recognized, but if it's RNA, how do you make sure that they get express into a peptide to be recognized by the T cells, right? And also, um, we need to find the right mutations and also make sure the T cells, if they are circulating, can go to the solid tumor sites to do the killing. And again, once they go to the solid tumor, we want to make sure they're not being suppressed by the pdl one or other checkpoint genes, right? So these are all challenges, but it's still because of the patients that are treated and are responding well, showing very, very exciting, uh, good responses, people are exploring all different ways. And uh, that, that's why um, I think the, uh, everybody in the cancer world are interested in cancer immunology now. Uh, and also, not only we can learn uh, cancer immunology better, I think the effort that are invested in this will help us understand infectious disease such as you know, COVID-19, uh, uh, allergy, autoimmune problem, and also aging. A lot of other diseases are immune-related. And so um, all of the work in cancer immunology are kind of relevant too. Okay, so that's on cancer, the, the different cancer immunotherapies. Questions on this?